everyone. I want to welcome you to the NAFEX 2021 uh, annual meeting, as well as a little bit of history about NAFEX. Uh, I'm Chris Heater. I'm the current president of NAFEX, and I'm here along with many of our board members who are volunteers with um, NAFEX. And what we want to do is first start out, and I'm going to share my screen here. I hope, actually, no, before I share my screen. Um, we're going to go through a little bit of history because um, a lot of people are new to NAFEX. Um, since we launched the announcement of this conference, we've had 250 people join us. Um, and so we have a lot of new people that we want to kind of give a little history and background. And I have a couple props, uh, but most of the history that I'm, I'm pulling from is from um, the handbook. And I don't know if it's backwards to you guys or if it's, if it's, if it's, you can read it, but apparently in, 19, in the 1980s, NAFEX published the handbook for NAFEX and there's a wealth of information, including the history. And so some of the things that I've pulled today to show you came from that handbook. And the cool thing is um, I actually got this online through Amazon, a used copy. And through the help of our treasurer, Chuck Wilson, um, we've been able to um, confirm that we have the right to republish this. So we're going to aim to do that um, and make that available to members here, hopefully in the next year. All right. So with that, I'm going to share my screen. Ooh. Um, there we go. All right. So let's start in a little bit about our history. Um, again, this is coming from the handbook uh, that was published back in the 1980s. NAFEX actually started out in the 60s and officially became a organization in 1967. But there's some history prior to that that was important to the lead up of NAFEX. And that was alluded to, I believe, on Monday night by Harry Burton. Um, he mentioned a round table of letters that, that circulated amongst fruit growers. And that turned out to be um, a round robin that started in the early 60s and grew to eight groups um, that were circulating letters. They would write a letter about their fruit growing experience and they would mail it to um, somebody. And then that person would collect the letters, put them all together, and then put them back out to their little group um, talking about their fruit growing experiences. At one point, that became um, an awful lot of work, and it was getting harder to, um, sometimes it was like with a round robin, it goes from one person to the next person to the next person. So in that line of people, if somebody forgot to mail it on, well, everything kind of fell apart. So um, my understanding is the two founders, um, when they came together, they really weren't keen on starting an organization, but they felt that there was a need for it. And so they got some seed money. Much of that was their own money that they put in to begin the group and formally created the nonprofit, the North American Fruit Explorers. So of the two founders, Milo Gibson was the first one. It took me a while to find a picture of him, but I did find one in the memorial edition of the quarterly that Mayfex puts out back in the 19, this is from the 1980s. And this is a picture of Milo and his wife. Um, uh, and this edition was, is, was a tribute to him. Milo was from, from Canada. And so the North American Fruit Explorers was a group of both um, US growers and Canadian growers. And so Milo um, came together with another fellow named Fred Jansen. And the two of them are the ones who started the North American Fruit Explorers. So uh, Fred is pictured there on the far right. So in the early years, now you have to remember in the 1960s, there was, there was, you know, this was a very different period of time. I know some of our audience out there wasn't even born in the 60s. So you, you won't have a recollection of that, but um, you know, there was no internet. There were no Xerox machines. Um, there were no computers. So when you wanted to get information out, you had to type it up. You had to find a mimeograph and you know if you don't know what a mimeograph is you might want to google that because it's pretty hilarious um and then you had to mail it by regular mail um they did organize meetings throughout um, the us and canada 
And so um, there were lots of collaborations and explorations going on. So there were fruit testing groups. People would get together around the kitchen table and test, you know, and, and try and taste different fruits. They might test growing things. Um, but there was a lot of exploration going on. And that's really where the North American Fruit Explorers, that's where the heart of it is, collaborating and exploring. There were lots of in-person experiences available. So there was a NAFEX visiting orchard program. So if you had an orchard, you could sign up to be on this list and you could organize a visit to your orchard. So people would travel from across the US or Canada and come visit your orchard and spend time and you could talk about you know, what you were growing, what your um, ups and downs with your experiences were. And it was a great way for people to learn from each other and to really get in the field and see what other people were doing. There were also educational resources. And again, this is pre-computer age. So NAFEX created a library and it was called the RW Daniels Library. And somebody would keep all of the records, all of the, the printed books and materials related to fruit growing. You could borrow a book and have it mailed to you and have, then mail it back when you were done. Um, anything you wanted, you could, they, they would print out a list of what was available and you could peruse that list and see if there was something that you wanted or needed. I will say that that library does not exist anymore. Um, but there are other ways to access some of this information and we'll talk about that later. Again, more educational resources, grafting, um, teaching people how to graft. So in the field or at a meeting, um, in, the, in this handbook that I, that I showed you earlier, there's a huge section on grafting and every type of graft you could imagine and how to do it. Um, so lots of education and sharing tips and tools of the trade. So this is an old picture from this manual. Um, but again, people sharing what tools they love to use, what they found helpful and useful. And even today at meetings, whether it's an Apex meeting or maybe a more local or regional meeting, you'll see people talking about what their favorite tool is and, and there'll be healthy debates about what's good. Do you use buddy tape on your graft versus parafilm? What kind of knife do you use? Um, and everyone's got their favorites and everyone has their reasons for using what they use. And so these were great opportunities to share those tips and the tools of the trade and learn from each other. Okay. Kind of jumping forward now into the computer age um, and really kind of addressing some of our pre-pandemic um, things that were going on. We have continued what we call the quarterly. So you know, all of this started with those, those letters, those round robin letters, and those eventually got consolidated into a quarterly newsletter or magazine. And it was usually typically from 25 to 50 pages. And it was, it was put together and mailed out to members four times a year. And we continue that tradition. Um, it had been in print all the way up until maybe about five or six years ago. And then for a couple of years, we stopped printing and only had a digital version, we have since brought that printed version back. Um, again, this is a great way to share stories, experiences, um, ask questions and connect with your fellow growers all across the North American. We do hold national conferences. We have prior to the pandemic, and we would meet once a year and have orchard tours. Um, the first one that I attended was four years ago in Danville, Illinois, and then I went to one in Iowa after that. And then in 2020, we were scheduled to meet with the California Rare Fruit Growers in Santa Rosa, and that got canceled because of the pandemic. Um, we do hope to bring in-person experiences back once we're out of the pandemic. Um, at these events, there would be grafting demonstrations. There would be lots of... Um, chances to share with each other. There would be a show and tell. Everyone would bring things that they were making or testing or trying um, and share those with the people there. And really it's a great learning experience. So we'll come back to um, these experiences when we get into our business meeting, because we want to talk about where we're going to go in the, in the years coming, especially once we come out of the pandemic, but just kind of keep some of these things in mind. So with that, I wanna to turn to two of our board members and ask them to share some of their recollections or memories or experiences 
why they joined NAFEX, and um, each of them comes from a different place. So Larry's been in NAFEX longer than most of us on the board, probably not all of us on the board. Taylor, while younger than me, has been on in NAFEX longer than I have and part of the board. So each of us comes from a different point in a different place, but I, we thought it would be very helpful, um, especially for those of you who just newly joined us to kind of hear why they joined us um, and what has, what has NAFEX, what have they gotten out of NAFEX and maybe a particular fond memory that they might have. So I'm gonna start with Larry. So Larry, if you would just like to give us, you know, a little background about maybe when you joined NAFEX why you joined it, and then what have you gained from your um, membership here at NAFEX? And Chris, if you want to do a stop screen share, I'll put us in gallery mode so folks can see Larry uh, on a large scale on the recording, and then we can come back to the PowerPoint. Taylor um, has lost video, but he I'm not sure he may be calling back in or getting in by phone. So um, I'm going to switch us into gallery mode here. Um, yeah, let me do that. Okay, great. So, um, Larry, why don't you go ahead? Okay, all right. <clears throat> well, I haven't been in Apex forever, maybe about 20 years. I guess I joined about 2000 or early 2000s. Um, we had 2,700 members when I joined. Uh, and this was pre Facebook page. So, Pomona was the way we communicated back then. I started out fruit growing just like everybody does. I went to the big box stores in the spring and bought standard varieties of apples and pears and plums and such and put them out. And it took me a while, a decade or two, to realize uh, they died and I planted repeatedly. And it took me a decade or two to realize why they weren't really thriving. And uh, I wondered about that. I was hard headed, you know, and determined to grow some fruit trees. So I kept on trying and trying. And just without any luck, you know, because I'm in Mississippi and that's a hard climate for stuff like apples and, pe and pears. Uh, we have a lot of disease pressure here. Not very good soil. Uh, so I researched and at the libraries, I could find stuff that were written about a, by a lot of northern writers uh, for a uh, normal climate, you know, and Mississippi's not in that category. Uh, the extension service wasn't much help. They sympathized and they could tell me a lot about peaches and pecans. And I wasn't particularly interested in those. I wanted to grow some apples and pears and stuff like that. Uh, so I struggled at it and didn't really grow uh, fruit trees successfully for a long time. Uh, eventually, home computers became popular and you could get on the Internet. And all of a sudden, research became much, much easier. Uh, in all my research on the internet, I kept running across the word NAFEX, uh, an acronym for the North America Fr Fruit Explorers, uh, which was apparently an organized group of uh, amateur fruit, ex fruit uh, growers. So that seemed interesting, and, and the fee was low. So, of course, I wanted to join that. And I joined and started getting my Pomonas. They were all printed back then. Uh, the first Pomona's I got, uh, wow, they just blew my mind. That was everything. That was the information I've been looking for all my life right there. You know, they were 40 or 50 or 60 pages written by the top experts in the field and uh, ex experts and just everyday experiences, too. That just blew my mind. I couldn't believe what I was reading. And all the variety names were bolded so I could read them so fast. Uh, that was so good. I, I read those things over and over and over. I read those first Pomona's just into pieces. You know, that was my reference book. And that was my connection with the fruit world right there. And I could find out what was going on currently and what everybody else was, was doing. So that was fantastic. I, I was so happy uh, to to be, to have that, you know, have that resource and be in that group. I was proud to be a fruit explorer with the rest of them. Um, after a few years, uh, Pomona went digital. We decided as a cost saving feature uh, would make them digital and send them out by the internet instead of printed copies. And uh, we lost a lot of members and I kind of lost track of it myself. And then one day I realized I wasn't getting my Pomona's regularly. 
anymore. So I had to learn how to use a computer uh, to get my Pomona's, you know, every every quarter, you know. So that had big influence on me. Um, it, I, I never will forget the very first Pomona I had had an article about a steaming apple. It was, I think it was by Lee Calhoun. It was an apple that was ugly and did not taste good right off the tree and didn't keep long. It didn't make cider. It had no purpose. But when you steamed it, it was delectable. It was best tasting apple you could ever find. And I thought that was fascinating, you know. And, uh, and nowadays I realize that's characteristic of a lot of heirloom uh, apples. Uh, they're not good fresh off the tree. They were grown for other purposes for steaming or drying or keeping or different purposes beside her. So that's interesting. And they got, that got me even more interested in the heirloom fruits. And uh, so that was my group of experts, the exact people that I needed to, to hook up with, tell me what to do. And uh, also uh, the regional groups, there's regional groups all over the country that are split off from NAPEX. Uh, the Southern Fruit Fellowship in my area. And through NAFEX, I was able to catch up with uh, people in the Southern Fruit Fellowship. And there I found people that could tell me exactly the types, apples and pears and, and whatnot that I could plant uh, that would work in my region. Uh, so that was that was my key to, find, to grow and fruit trees successfully is to find the mentors that could give me a clue is what I needed to be doing. And... Uh, I, the first annual meeting I went to was in 2013. Uh, I met Lee Calhoun there. Another member and I conspired together to nag the man and to join in our meeting and giving us a little talk. And he did. And it was fantastic. We had a lot of young people there. <clears throat> he was pretty old at times. So he gave us a lot. He gave us an earful of experiences, you know, and shared a lot of stuff. And uh, after the meeting, you know, I was talking to Mr. Lee. And tell him, I just love the, the stuff he had done, you know, researching all these old heirloom varieties of apples. And I wish I could do it, the same thing. But I was in Mississippi, of course, you know, so of course I couldn't grow apples, you know, in, in a climate like this. And Mr. Lee said, uh, well, now, and he gave me the contact information for some people that were growing in my same climate and soil that have been growing apples for a few decades. People like uh, Stacy Russell, uh, Jack Caring. Joyce Neighbors in Alabama, the Alabama Apple Lady, uh, Henry Lawson in uh, Ball Ground, Georgia, uh, people like that, that for several decades in most of their adult life had been growing heirloom apples and pears and such like that, exactly what I was interested in. So that was my key to find the people, the mentors that uh, could tell me what to grow, you know, and had the sign wood for stuff and encouraged me. So that that was pretty big to me. Um, Netflix. Uh, actually has had a huge influence on my life, I would have to say. My life has taken a different path because of NAFEX and the friends that I've met through there. I'm running a full-time uh, nursery business now, and that's not something I would imagine I would have ever done 20 or 30 years ago. But it's uh, something that was uh, became a, a hobby because of my failures, I got more and more interested in it because of all my failures. Became a hobby and then a serious hobby and then a part-time business and now a full-time business. So NAFEX has had more of an influence on my life, I guess, than most people. But uh, I love it. And now I, I'm in a full-time nursery business. I get to, I spend several hours a day. Really, all I do is, is talk to people on NAFEX or the other associated fruit groups and my customers. You know, I spend a few hours a day just answering questions from customers and potential customers. And uh, it's a huge part of my life now. So uh, I got a lot for my $25 a year NAFEX membership. <laughs> that is great. It's Thank been you. a ride. <laughs> all right. Taylor, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. I'm awesome. so sorry I don't have my video on. Oh, that's okay. So uh, Taylor, Taylor um, was on the board before I ever joined NAFEX. Um, Taylor has been very instrumental in bringing some of the history to life. Um, he was part of the digi digitizing uh, all of the Pomona's that we have. But um, so he's gonna, you know, bring his perspective. He hasn't been in as long as Larry, um, but he has been in longer than I have. So Taylor. Share your thoughts. What got you here? What have you gained? Sure. Uh, I apologize if my dog is barking. Um, but uh, 
So, yeah, I kind of remember this distinct experience. I was in Asheville, North Carolina. I live in Northeast Tennessee, and I was walking downtown, and we were walking somewhere, and I was on a path, and we were in a park, and then, boom, there was a fig tree in front of me full of fresh, ripe figs, and I'd never even seen a fig tree before, uh, never had eaten a ripe fig before, and I was just totally amazed and then realized I was in the middle of an edible park um, and came to find out that Asheville had a whole handful of these edible parks and there was a group that took care of them and had planted them and, and did regular pruning parties and uh, taught people how to graft and stuff like that. And so I was part of a nonprofit where I lived and was interested in agriculture and kind of really got inspired by that and the concept of a food forest. And so I, there was a local organization that was doing a small grant to, it was called the Trees That Feed Grant, and uh, they provided some money to buy trees and a, like a little conference. And so I applied for that. I got it. Um, I had a plan to plant it at like a church food pantry because I was living, I was a poor recent uh, graduate, recent uh, college graduate living in the city with, with no land, just renting. Um, so I got that grant and I went to that conference and I met a gentleman named Bill Whipple. He was the keynote speaker. And I talked to him afterwards and he said, I, I was kind of peppering him with questions. And he said, if you'll join NAFEX, then uh, I'll, I'll mentor you in this first planting. So went on, went on the line, found nafex.org, paid my, paid my $19. And I guess the rest is history. Um, I got, I actually got set up with some really good trees at that conference. There were a couple of local nurseries that were there. And then we, they gave us kind of like tokens and we bought the trees from there and went back and planted them with the community. And those were literally the first trees I'd ever planted Arkansas black apple and a Liberty apple and, um, I planted some pawpaw or we all planted some pawpaws and a bunch of other stuff like that. Um, so since then I've been planting, uh, all kinds of different fruit and nut trees, just learning from NAFEX members. NAFEX members have been so generous and sending out uh, scion wood to me doing trades. I've been paying attention to trees in the landscape and have found like a June pear that is just amazing here. Um, great for cooking with um, and just always looking out for fruit trees out the out the windows um, and have really, really loved the annual meetings. Um, my first one was in 2014. I got a little grant to go and I cold called Jerry and Barb Lehman and they were kind of on my route to, it was in, uh, it was in La Crosse, Wisconsin. And they said that I could stay at their place. So I, on my way up to La Crosse, I got to stay with Jerry and Barb in their basement. And Jerry gave me a tour of his uh, persimmon orchard where he was doing incredible work. And that, that totally just blew my mind and was really amazing to meet Jerry and, and develop a friendship with him and with Barb. Um, and yeah, I, I didn't really prepare a uh, speech, but um... awesome. <laughs> that is great. That's great. So um, I will give you kind of my perspective. So um, I, I had lived in a urban um, neighborhood and when I moved in, we had no landscaping. So I went and I planted three blueberry bushes. I had no idea what I was doing. I planted them. Um, I got lucky really, because there was nobody to mentor me, but they survived and for 20 years produced fruit. And then about eight years ago, my husband and I decided we had our midlife crisis. Um, we decided that we were tired of living in a neighborhood. We wanted to go and find someplace rural to live. And um, around that time, I had met Keith Johnson, who spoke yesterday at the permaculture uh, session. Um, he had a little urban uh, homestead here with his partner, Peter Bain, and I went to, to 
see that place and what they were doing and the amount of fruit and food they were growing in just a small amount of space was just blew my mind. So between that, um, seeing what he was doing, um, I happened across the Indiana Fruit or Nut and Fruit Growers Association and went to that five years ago, met Jerry Lehman. He was the first person I met. Um, Jerry has since passed away. Um, but Jerry and his wife, Barb, took me around and introduced me to people. And a long story short, within a year and a half, um, Jerry had, um, with a committee, um, worked with me and my husband. We just bought property and they wanted to put a fruit and nut repository on our property um, so that we could collect a lot of varieties and make those available to people in the area. So um, he had been out to our property and helped us get started with that. And um, about a month before he died, he apparently had called up Chuck Wilson, and I, I didn't know Chuck at the time, um, but had recommended that I speak at the um, North American Fruit, uh, Fruit Explorers Conference that was going to be in Iowa. And um, Chuck called me up and asked me if I'd speak. And I'm like, I, I'm a new grower. I, I don't know anything. And and Chuck said, oh, Jerry, Jerry says you can talk. <laughs> so I said, okay. So I went and I spoke about the early days of this repository. And, um, you know, in between that time, uh, Jerry actually passed away. And so um, I felt that that was kind of a calling for me to go and, and do what he had asked, you know, what he wanted me to do. So I spoke there and also at that time, um, Chuck and um, a few others recruited me for the board along with Eric Bina. And then shortly after that, I became on the board and, and here I am as president. So um, I am new to the group, newer than most, newer than any, you know, many of the people who came before me on the board, um, but it's been a fabulous group and I have met so many wonderful people, um, both in person and virtually. So. I will echo what um, Larry and Taylor have said and just the connections you make are phenomenal. And if you have a question, there's always someone to reach out to. So it's been a wonderful experience. And so those of you who are new out there, I encourage you to you know, stick around. Um, it, it may take time to meet people, but um, there's so much that, that you can get from NAFEX and so much that you can eventually give to others through NAFEX, all right? So with that, I am going to go back to my share screen. Why does it keep, uh, let's see. All right. So with that, we wanna kind of switch gears and get into our annual meeting. We'll come back to some of the things we talked about, um, but every year we do have an annual meeting. Um, this is a time when we discuss old business and bring up new business. We have elections usually for officers and um, that's gonna be a little bit different this year and I'll, I'll talk about that when we get there. But I'm gonna officially now call this to order. We follow Robert's rules of order. So it's 3.30, I'm calling the meeting to order. And hopefully Leslie, if you can hear me, maybe take any notes. It should be mostly here. On Absolutely, the I'm happy to do that. And I'll just point out because it's not obvious that if anybody, as we get into this um, and you want to point to uh, Q&A or discussion, the okay. best thing to do is under the reaction smiley face button on the bottom of your Zoom bar is where you can press to raise your hand. I don't know why they hide it there, but they do. And so there's a spot for raising hands. Um, do that and then we can call on you and invite you to unmute and, uh, and display your video. Um, if others, you know, keep their video off, as I said earlier, it just helps with the uh, keep the bandwidth strong for everybody who's participating. So Great. go ahead, Chris. All right. So we're called to order. Um, I first just want to introduce our board. So you've seen many of them already. I am the, the president currently. Um, Taylor Malone has been the vice president. Um, our secretary had been Eliza. And uh, she had to step down earlier this year because she's just super busy. And between Tim and uh, Leslie, they have helped fill that vacancy from time to time. And we will be refilling, we will be filling that vacancy here after uh, this, probably the start of the new year. And then our treasurer, Charles Wilson, or we call him Chuck. Um, he has been our treasurer now for, for several years and does an amazing job. 
Um, so that's the officers of the board. Um, membership, usually there's a membership um, person who, who has strictly been in charge of membership. Um, now that we've gone more to the membership, most of it being online, that's not needed as much. And so Chuck and myself um, kind of keep track of all of that. And I think we now have that all under control um, online. So it's something that's not nearly as much work as it used to be. And then our conference chair this year has been Leslie. You guys have seen her a lot. She's done a phenomenal job. She has a background in conference, um, conference doing conferences. So um, it's been just a, a blessing to have her uh, lead us through this new way of doing conferences. So um, a, a huge hats off to her for that. And then our other directors, um, you've, you've met Larry, um, we've got Jorge, Chris and Tim, um, they've all been fantastic this past year. Um, Chris and Tim and Jorge and Leslie all came on at the beginning of this year and they've just really done an amazing job of, of coming together and, and helping us do so much this year, even in the midst of a pandemic. Our outgoing um, board members, I've mentioned Eliza and then Justin Holtz. Um, he had to step down earlier this year because he's got a new baby. And so we will be filling at least two positions and we actually want to expand to more directors. So we'll talk about that in a bit. So this business meeting, I'm going to try and keep it short and sweet. I want it um, really to be done by four. So we're not here um, too long. So um, following Robert's rules of orders, we will kind of briefly go over last year's meeting minutes. Leslie Wade's going to present that. I'm going to give the financial report on behalf of Chuck, um, and then I'm going to go through old business and kind of give a, a update on some of that old business. We'll talk about a few new business items, and then we'll go through um, what we need to do for updating bylaws and holding our elections. So Leslie, I'm going to turn it back to you to just kind of uh, briefly go over the 2020 meeting minutes. That sounds great. If you want to stop your screen share, I'll flip over to mine okay. and then we'll come back to yours in a second. Um, and I'm giggling because I've actually never organized a conference before in my life. Oh, <laughs> no, I have a professional communications background, so that definitely helps. Right. But no, this is and I've been involved and I've sat through many conferences, but this is my first time organizing one. Let me do a quick share screen. And I'm gonna pull up the meeting. So I hope everyone can see this on my screen. These are the minutes from our annual meeting last year held on uh, December 14th. This one uh, was held, I think on Zoom because of the pandemic, of course. So uh, without reading all of these in detail, I'll just give you the highlights. Um, we um, reviewed and approved the 2019 annual meeting minutes. We went through our financial report, including our revenues um, from dues of about um, 20,000, an increase of about 4,000. That may in fact be dues and some other donations. Um, and that full financial report was published in the winter 2021 Pomona on page 10, if anybody is desirous to go back and have a little financial flashback. Um, so for new business, uh, at the time, Chris, mentioned uh, that we need to review the bylaws. Now, thanks to the efforts of Chris Lomannix, Tim Lussier, and other members of our board, um, we're gonna be bringing those forward and Chris will talk about that in a minute. Um, mentioned uh, that the 2021 annual conference would be in person, but of course, here we are. So um, very happy that at least we were able to meet virtually. And then the election was for the slate of new officers, which included, um, uh, Jorge Zaldivar, Chris Omanix, um, Tim, sorry for all the scrolling, Tim Lucier, and myself, Leslie Wade, and that passed unanimously. And so that was the recap for the annual meeting minutes of last year. Great. So we need a motion. Uh, I'm going to ask one of our board members to help with this. And we need a motion to approve the minutes. Uh, motion to approve the minutes. Chris Omanix here. Thank you. We need a second. Second. All right, Jorge has seconded. And then Leslie is gonna draw up the poll feature, which is gonna allow people to vote to approve or 
not approve or abstain from the meeting minutes. So if you can take a moment to go ahead and do that. That should flash up on your screen. You can click what you wish and submit. All right, so you all can be doing that. I can continue talking, I think, from there. All can right, I just, so can I just add one thing, Chris? Sure. New members are welcome to vote on the minutes. If you feel yes. comfortable with it, it doesn't, you don't have to have been attendee at that minute, at that meeting to cast a, a ballot in favor of approving the minutes. It's an administrative action, so feel free, even if you weren't there, to participate in approving those minutes if you feel comfortable. Um, if you don't, of course, you can abstain. All right, so I'm gonna go back to screen share. All right. All right, so the financial report um, to date for this year, keeping in mind, so we run a calendar year, so January to December, we have not finished um, the year. The income from um, membership alone, along with um, a, some donations for the conference has been over 13,000. This does not include um, income that we receive from a mutual fund, which I'll talk about in a moment. But we will have the final numbers at the end of the year and we will publish those in the winter 2022 Promona. Expenses to date have been around 5,300. Um, the printed Pomona for this year has cost us about $1,800. The conference we anticipate is going to be less than 1,000, and that's you know in part because this is virtual, that there's very few costs associated. And then we do have a research grant um, program, and we will have been, we will we've given out close to 2,000. We will be giving out about 2,500 by the end of the year. So all told about 5,300. So we are definitely doing quite well um, from, a, from a financial point for this year. And um, as of today, I talked to Chuck, the cash on hand, which um, you know we report to you guys. We have two checking accounts. Um, normally we would just have one, but we switched to a new um, bank in 2020, um, but left the old one open um, because there was a, a, an online um, Square account associated with it. So we left it as well. So right now we have um, over $37,000 um, cash on hand available in those checking accounts. Uh, years ago, and I, I can't tell you when this was, Chuck would probably know, or maybe Larry, but um, whoever was on the board at the time, and this might have been um, Jerry Lehman because he did this with the Indiana group, but they were wise to take some of the money and invest it in a mutual fund. And so, and, and much of the money I think that came in um, for grants and research um, purposes might be invested as well. So the Morgan Stanley account has $52,000 sitting in it. Um, that's really not cash on hand. It's, it's invested and in, you know, we pull from it if we need it. But the total assets right now are over $90,000, which really puts us in a very um, good position should we have a bad year or um, you know, something that we need to draw extra money from. I think we're sitting quite well. All right, so unless there's any questions, I'm assuming there's probably not gonna be any questions on the finances, but if there are, feel free to put them in the Q&A and we can circle back to that if we need to. I now wanna kind of turn to the old business, um, which I have themed or renamed surviving and growing forward in the midst of a pandemic, because um, when I came on the board and as president, I came on the board and president all at once. It was in August of 2019. That was just, what, five months before the pandemic really um, started to become a, a possibility. Um, and at that time, we were down to 350 members. And we really needed to do something to kind of bring membership back. When that, when that um, handbook was published that I mentioned in the 1980s, in this handbook, they specifically say at the time they had 3,000 NAFEX members. So um, because of the digital era and many other you know, things that had happened, membership dropped significantly. And so we recognized that we really needed to do something to help grow that and, and bring people back or interested in growing fruit. So that was one of our missions. So 
part of that old business was to bring back the printed Pomona. As Larry and I both mentioned, it had gone digital and that was a cost saving measure because it was getting really, really expensive to, to print and mail out over a thousand or 2000 copies of the Pomona. Um, it was literally bankrupting the organization. So in bringing back the Pomona, we did it um, the way that um, I kind of piggybacked off what the Indiana uh, Nut and Fruit Growers does, and that is make it optional. So, you know, if someone wanted it digital, they can just have it as digital and we will not have to pay to print it for those people. But we recognized that there were people that we lost in the group or people who really um, were not connected online. You know, they might be our elders, they might be in the Amish community, they might be um, off grid and, and they don't, you know, unless it was shipped to them as a printed Pomona, they would never see it or read it. And so therefore they lost interest in Apex. So we brought back the printed Pomona on demand. So if, if somebody wanted it as a printed Pomona mail to them, they could request that. And we eventually added just, a, created what was called the full membership so that people pay just a little bit more to help cover those costs. So I'm happy to say that as of um, December of 2019, we brought back the printed Pomona. The first time I, I shipped it out, we had 30 people who wanted it. And as of this last printing, we've had 230 or 40 who have requested it. So that number is growing. Um, we are using an online printing source that is very economical, and so it's made it um, very affordable for us to do this. We also needed to bring the website up to date, and we had some access issues with that um, because of somebody who had been uh, related to the website um, had some life-changing events, and so we really needed to bring other people on board. So Eric Bina and Taylor Malone were very instrumental in helping get the website up to date and um, functioning and adding some things that we really needed it to do. So hats off to those guys, because they, they're amazing. So then bringing us into 2020, y'all know, as of March, 2020, we went into the full mode pand pandemic. And that meant that we had to take what had planned to be our in-person conference in Santa Rosa with the California Rare Fruit Growers to either canceling it completely or trying something different. And so, um, we did kind of a really loose and um, trial of a virtual conference. We did it as Zoom. We held um, four Zoom meetings once a month between November, December of 2020 and carried it over into 2021. And those turned out to be attended. Um, you know, I was thinking, oh, it might just be me, but um, we did have people attend. And I think everyone welcomed the opportunity to connect with fellow fruit growers while being shut in and, and quarantined. So um, that turned out to be a blessing in disguise in many ways. It, it led us to our conference this year, which has been amazing. So, and, and I think um, going forward, we'll talk about this in a bit, but I, I think our conferences are gonna have a whole new look, both in-person and virtual in the years to come. We wanted to bring back interest groups. I haven't talked much about those, but back in the day before the internet, interest groups were a big thing in NAFEX. So if you were interested in growing persimmons, there was a persimmon interest group. If you were interested in growing Southern apples, there was a Southern apples interest group. Those kind of fell by the wayside with um, the invention, so to speak, of social media and Facebook and all those groups. And so a lot of that kind of fell by the wayside. Back in their heyday, a lot of those interest groups would um, publish their own little newsletters and send it out to those who were interested. This is one for Asian persimmons that I happen to have a couple of copies of. Um, and so that was a way for people to connect about the particular fruits they were interested in growing. We had an interest last year in trying to bring that back in some form or fashion. And so we tried some online Zoom meetings for interest groups. We had a persimmon online um, interest group meeting, which turned out to be very popular. And we're really looking to kind of bring more of that um, in the years to come. So that's something to keep in the back of your head if you're interested or any of you who might be interested in helping run a group. You don't have to be an expert. You just have to be um, willing to help kind of herd the cats and get them together, so to speak, all right? So those were the two big things for 2020. Um, moving into 2021, we all thought, hey, we'll be out of the pandemic, right? We'll go back to in-person meetings. And obviously that was not possible to 
um, have an in-person meeting, you really have to start planning a year in advance. And that wasn't really, that wasn't really possible because nobody knew when we were coming out of the pandemic and you can't really rent or, or put, you know, deposit down in a place, not knowing if you're going to be able to have the meeting or not. So we switched our, um, our focus to the in-person or to the virtual conference that we're holding right now. Our goal this year was also to increase our outreach diversity and membership. And I'm very happy to say we have been very successful in doing that thanks to this conference. Um, and we are doing a deeper dive into our interest group chair list and trying to find out who is still around and still interested. And then Eric Bina created a regional help um, thing on our website that will go through tomorrow night at our happy hour. So um, this will be a place online where you can kind of reach out to people in your area and learn more and, and connect with people who are, are interested in, in the things that you're doing and growing. And then the other thing that we needed to do this year was to really dive deep into the bylaws because they were very dated in some respects. They had been updated about four or five years ago, um, but we recognized that there were some things in there that really needed to be addressed. So the new business, um, I, I guess, before I move into new business, are there any questions about the old business? And folks can put stuff in the chat or you can raise your hand um, and uh, unmute yourself or uh, feel free to just unmute yourself. We're, we're a small group of 36. So I think we can, we can do that if you have a question at this point. All right, we can always come back to questions out in old business if we need to. So I'm gonna go ahead and move on to the new business. So there are three quick things. We need to briefly talk about the bylaws. We need to talk about upcoming elections and we um, need to kind of talk about our 2022 goals and the conference. So the bylaw revisions, um, as we've already talked about, Chris Homanix really embraced this as did Tim um, and really dived deep into the bylaws. And, and Chris has a really good foundational background in nonprofits and bylaws. And so, um, there are, are several different things that we address. I'm not, we're not gonna go through the bylaws in any detail. These have been sent out to members about a week and a half, two weeks ago, and I'm gonna resend it so that everybody has a chance to review it before voting on it. Um, but what we did was we updated gender references. So keeping in mind, NAFEX began in the 60s, and back then most organizations like this were created by men, run by men, and you know women were not, growing fruit back then. And that's, you know, that's just how it was. Um, we are coming into the 21st century. So we are, you know, all the gender references are now neutral. Um, there were a lot of committee inconsistencies. There's committees listed in the bylaws that, you know, to my knowledge, haven't been around for quite some time. Um, we're recognizing that there's now 21st century technology. So when the bylaws were created and even five years ago, um, people were still, everything was in person in terms of meetings. And so we've added language to include um, the opportunities for online board meetings and, and the case of, you know, who knew we'd have a pandemic and we'd have to meet, have our annual meeting online. But we have put that language in there to help um, recognize that those situations might arise. And then we're addressing social media a little bit because social media is now here to stay and it's growing by leaps and bounds and always changing. And so we've, we've put some language in there to kind of um, help address that and, and keep control of the NAFEX name in social media. And then um, Chris did a great job of making sure that we're conforming to nonprofit legal responsibilities and requirements. So again, I'm gonna invite you guys when I send that out by email that you review that. Um, and you'll have the opportunity to vote yes or no. If you have any questions or concerns or want to raise anything, you can certainly do that before you vote. You can reach out to us directly and we can, um, we can talk about those things with you and see if there's, you know, if there's any errors, we can address those. All right, the next thing that we normally would do in an annual meeting is hold elections. And normally in an in-person meeting, we would do it right then and there. Um, but um, last year we did it a little bit differently and um, we did it online at a Zoom meeting. And this year we're gonna try it by voting electronically and by um, 
for those who, who are not online by snail mail. So again, I mentioned we have some members who are um, in the Amish community or who are off grid, who, you know, will not, who, who don't get on a computer and we wanna honor and, and be respectful of their, their uh, as them as members and allow them to be able to vote. So um, I'm gonna tell you right now that we have three people who've been nominated and we're still looking for more nominations. The nominating committee has is, is kind of been, um, I, I, I actually emailed up uh, Bill Grimes who um, was, was a part of the nominating committee with Barbara last year um, and just got some insights from him. And then um, the board has also been helpful in, in kind of creating this nominating committee. So um, we are nominating, I'm nominating Adam Bingham. Um, he has been one of our grant recipients. And if you have been in NAFEX for a while, you know that he, he does a great job of submitting content to the Pomona. Um, and I know he's very enthusiastic about NAFEX. So um, he's accepted my nomination. Um, I've also nominated Taylor Yowell. He has um, been on the board before. He also stepped up last year as the Persimmon, the Native American Persimmon Interest Group um, leader. And he's accepted that nomination. And then um, Chris and Tim have nominated Nick Pascal from Washington. And um, what I'm gonna be doing with each of these guys is um, sending out their bios when, uh, in the next week or so. And then if we have any other further nominations, I'll include those as well. Um, we minimally need to, not, uh, to elect two, but we as a board agree the more the merrier. So if everyone is in agreement of you know, more than two, we'll take on more than two. So what we are missing from the board, you know, we, we want um, a huge diversity, not only in age and gender, and, um, but also in location. So right now on the board, we're missing people from the Northeast area, the Southwest area, and Canada. And I would love to see people from those areas be on our board. So if you're someone who's interested, um, or if you know somebody who would be great and you want to nominate them, please reach out to us at the admin at nafexmembers.org um, email address, and um, we'll work with, with you all to try and bring those nominations to the membership. So bylaws and election voting, again, will be done a little bit differently this year that's going to be done by email and regular mail. It's going to be sent out after Thanksgiving and votes will be due back. Um, by December 20th, it'll be electronic and you'll just, you know, click on things, submit, and then we will, um, the program that we use will automatically tally the votes for us. All right. All right. So very last phase here, NAFEX growing forward in 2022. These are the things that we as a board recognize that we need to um, work on. And the first and foremost is the 2022 conference and what that's going to look like. Um, we had, you know, possibility of going back in person, um, perhaps teaming up with another group like the California River Fruit Growers or with the Northern Nut Growers, um, or going virtual again, or some, some sort of hybrid. I personally, as someone who is in a university setting and a teaching setting, um, I can tell you hybrid is here to stay. Um, people have now been able to connect and attend conferences that they normally could not have afforded to go to in the past. So I firmly believe that our conferences going forward while we wanna return in person, um, I, I fully think that we are now capable of also streaming an in-person conference. So I think that's a huge plus because for a young grower, maybe someone who is just out of, you know, school or you know maybe is just starting out as a farmer they don't have the the means to travel or the time to travel and so this will be a way for them to connect so um thankfully um we have worked out large in part to tim and leslie how to do this in future years stream it record it and make it available so as we get this worked out, we will keep you guys apprised. And if you have any um, thoughts on this and you wanna share them, feel free to do that with us at any time. We wanna to continue to increase our outreach diversity in our membership. 
Again, remember I told you that in the 80s, we had 3,000 members and we have lost a significant number in the years. And we are now in that uptrend again, and we want to continue to see that grow. And, you know, the talks that I've listened to so far, last night's um, talk is a perfect example of, um, of fruit growing knowledge that has almost been lost. And, you know, going back to our elders and, and, and getting that information and learning it and sharing it with the younger generations. I think this is, this is key so that we don't lose these um, heritage varieties that we have, that we don't lose the knowledge on how to grow them um, and that we have food security. So all of these things are important. And I think it's, I think increasing our outreach is gonna be one of our key um, goals this coming year. And then the interest groups, we want to continue exploring those and how to make and support those groups and group activities. Um, there's lots of ways this can go and we'll just kind of brainstorm on that and um, keep you guys in the loop as we figure things out. And if you have any ideas, feel free to share them with us. Or if you wanna be participating in that, let us know. So here are the numbers, you know, we're going to get down to the nitty gritty here. We, we want to commit, you know, the board is committed to helping us grow. We want you to join us in that effort. Um, we want to rebuild our NAFEX community. We want to inspire those new generations of growers. We want to preserve our heritage um, and, and all the knowledge that has existed for the last couple of, de uh, you know, centuries and keep that going. So, you know, again, when I came on, we were at 350, 375, it kind of fluctuated. In 2020, we grew up to 400 members. This year, we're now over 650 members. And, you know, we would love to see us reach 1,000 in 2022 and go beyond that. So um, you guys who are not on the board, you can help us with this. Spread the word. Invite somebody um, to, you know, to become an AFX member. And um, a great example for those of you who are um, commercially growing or, um, at farmers markets, spread the word that way. Larry has been just phenomenal in terms of, of his his ideas of spreading the word, and so I'm, he and I are both very passionate about really getting to children and um, spreading that love of growing, whether it be from seed or picking an apple or whatever it may be, but really inspiring the children and because those they're our future generations. So this was on the back of the handbook and I thought it, it, it really kind of drove home the point that we're at. Um, and that is, you know, both um, physically and metaphorically, new life comes from old roots. So from a tree, you can, this is something that Keith, um, I believe talked about yesterday in permaculture, you can, you can coppice a tree and it will sprout right back up. Those roots are still there. They may be old, but they, new life can come from those roots and, and that make that tree even stronger in years to come and make it live and last longer. So, you know, not only can that be done with trees, but I think with this organization that we, we have a lot of life to bring to this organization. And I think we need to draw on our elders and learn from them, keep what they started going bring that to our new and young generations. And our future is really with those young generations. It takes, you know, getting the children out into the orchard, showing them what an apple on a tree looks like. There are so many children that have never ever experienced picking a piece of fruit or seeing it in its own native habitat. You know, to them, fruit comes from a grocery store and we need to change that. Um, we need to get kids involved in planting and growing. Um, this picture below is actually my niece and nephew who were helping me plant a couple years ago. Um, getting their hands in the ground, getting dirty, um, showing them how things are grown. And then taking it to our schools. This is a great example here in Indiana. This is a, a program that the Indiana nut and fruit growers are helping to sponsor, um, but planting at schools fruit and nut trees, getting them, getting those kids, teaching them. Um, those are experiences that they will remember and um, hopefully inspire some of them to go on and become fruit growers themselves. 
And then just to, to wrap this up, um, I really love this. I, I'd seen this once before, and I think Harry Burton um, shared it again. It was maybe Monday night. Um, but, you know, this is one of the simplest ways of spreading the word, you know, give somebody a seed, plant it, you know, you don't have to have a fancy business card. You don't even have to have a business. Just share, share some seeds or share your knowledge, make it simple. Um, and the more you do it, the more the word spreads. And so I hope that all of us leave this with the, the, the idea that we can go out and help um, make a better world. We can help inspire people to grow more fruit and um, really kind of let this take off and, um, and help others. So with that, I'm going to ask one of our board members to make a motion to close the meeting, unless we have questions. Um, we well, do Tracy, have a couple. Uh, Sorry. I was we... going to say, go ahead, Leslie. No, go ahead, Tim. Well, I was going to just speak to uh, Chris O'Manix and I uh, real quick, just to wrap up, just since we were referenced. Um, we just, obviously, you summarized pretty well our intentions with just kind of making sure uh, we didn't really change too much of the uh, ethos of the bylaws. I had heard Taylor and I think Larry or somebody else had kind of just done a big bylaw revision a couple of years ago. But yeah, most of it was uh, just technical changes. So that's where our intentions came from. Um, so great job, Chris Omanix, who really was hyper focused. And, and I know Leslie um, kind of did a little typo editing and all that. So the board basically uh, has revised um, the bylaws. Um, so I think that that was great uh, that everybody kind of got their reviews on it. So I hope the general membership um, is able to um, uh, approve that uh, because I think that was good changes. Um, and then uh, just real quick speaking to my nomination of Nick Casco, who's a, a young uh, guy from uh, Seattle, Washington area. Um, he was on the NAFEX Facebook page, which I consider a free for all um, since you don't have to be a paid member to be on our Facebook page or, or our group, I should say the Facebook group. Uh, but Nick Casco is posting about cherry tree that he found um, and he generously mailed me uh, some of the seeds uh, and then I insisted or encouraged him to become a paid NAFEX member because he did seem like a genuine fruit explorer. And then Nick Casco became, I believe, our 300th member in the spring. And since then, because of the great work Leslie has done, uh, we've doubled our membership up to 600. So um, I nominated Nick Casco. He's from an immigrant family, really good kid, really great uh, self-trained orchardist. And I think he would be an excellent addition to our board as a, as a self-trained um, uh, fruit explorer. Um, and then I think the other nominations are excellent. So I hope we can nominate all three and we have positions open for three, three more positions. So uh, from, from me as a board of director, I would encourage um, the, us to add all three of those nominations or at least I'll, 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 I'll push for Nick Casco as well as the two other gentlemen who I believe uh, most of the board members know. So um, great job, everybody. I'm new to the board. I'm a year into this. I was inspired by the Oregon community of, of, of tree growers, apple tree growers, that was mentioned a lot with the Lost Apple Tree Project on, on the, our first night of our conference. Um, and I was really inspired by Chris Omanix, fellow board member, who's the co-founder of the Agrarian Sharing Network. Um, and I'm passionate about growing this organization up to the 3,000 members uh, in five years in 2025. I think that would be a very easy goal for us to attain. So thank you to Larry and Chris and Taylor and all of the, the leaders before us so we can honor um, the, the many, many years of, of dedicated fruit, fruit growers. So thanks for, thanks for listening and thanks for having me on the board. Thank you, Tim. Um, hey, Chris, before we um, do the motion to close, can I just share a couple of comments that have come in in the chat? Sure. Um, so we have, um, Aris had said, I would really appreciate your efforts to keep online accessibility for future conferences. Um, so, um, because a lot of people can't attend in person. So I think we have some um, agreement there. Um, let me see. Um, so uh, Janet shared that she joined because she saw a link on the Cummins Nursery site website and that getting our name out on other websites like that out there would be a great idea. And I think that uh, I would certainly echo that. Um, and then, um, it's this is his handle so um i presume it's jack it's uh, west virginia m jack 
uh, is a retired biologist, is stepping forward to say he'd like to help uh, submit and edit some articles for the Pomona, which is wonderful. Wonderful. Um, so he'll be in touch with us. And Taylor uh, also shared that he wanted to make sure we give a big shout out to Bill Grimes and Barb Rochelt before for their efforts to edit the last time we went around and did the bylaws. So, and then uh, Pat Holland asks if, um, who has access to our full membership list? And I said, we don't publish all of that information for privacy reasons, but I know we do share um, some of our contact information in our interest group. So maybe Chris, you could clarify how we share our contact information sure. within NAPEX. Yeah, so um, just for those who've been around, this has come up and, and I do want to clarify this because I think this is an important, important thing. If you have been in NAFEX for a long time, you will recall that um, NAFEX would always publish the, the complete um, membership list with addresses. This was back before the internet. Um, and at the time that was, that was a wonderful, wonderful thing to do, wonderful resource. I think in the last decade, um, with things going online and with there being um, some some events that um, have not been good, um, and, and I, it's not necessarily in Nafex, but I can give you an example. So there have been you know farms that have been raided, or you know people going on farms and stealing fruits and things like that. So you know, sadly. Um, the world has changed a bit. And so we have um, really worked to respect the privacy of our members so that we don't have some, um, some negative events happening. So um, one of the ways we've gotten around that is, you know, if, if there's an interest group chair that um, the chairs have usually been willing to have their information shared. And when we publish um, articles in the Pomona, um, we encourage people to include their email address so that you can reach out directly. Um, if you ever experience any sort of harassment or anything like that, please do let us know. Um, and then um, we have created this regional help um, thing online that we'll go through tomorrow night at the happy hour, but that will be a way to connect with people but still maintain your privacy. All right, so you can choose how much information you want to give out. So, you know, your your location, your contact information is your, um, you know, is yours, and we don't want to violate privacy. So that's one of the reasons why we don't publish this anymore. We have a raised hand from Chris Homanix. Mm -hmm. I'll make it quick because I, I like Chris's comment about you know, uh, get in, get out, be done. <laughs> um, so Chris Mannix here, uh, new board member as well. Um, thank you to Bill Grimes for uh, nominating me. Appreciate it. Um, and I, I just wanted to say that uh, we we are all committed, uh, like Tim said, to, to growing our membership. Um, I, I know that society is kind of going the other way in terms of kind of uh, shunting or putting to side um, civic organizations, but um, I think this is a really important civic organization to protect. You know, we are the North American Fruit Explorers and the we is everybody here and, you know, all, all your friends that, that didn't come, all your colleagues that didn't come today. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm really committed and something I want to just bring uh, out to the group here is that uh, I think it's important that we collaborate with uh, all the other groups around the country. Um, I, I know Bill, Bill, you're a part of CRFG, California Rare Fruit Growers. Um, and I, I see Gene, hi Gene. Uh, Gene Williams is uh, part of the uh, Western Cascade Fruit Society and, and is an excellent apple idea um, and a great person. And I, I just, I know there are other folks here that are part of other organizations. And we really want to collaborate. Um, I think that uh, you know nature teaches us that there, while there is competition, that uh, off, often the way that we get ahead is collaboration. And um, I'm I'm excited for the future, and uh, I I want to make my own personal efforts as a board member and a human being to collaborate with with the um, all the others that are you know Hawaii Hawaii fruit growers. The folks down in Florida, uh, folks in Canada, uh, we really want to bring uh, the North America back to North America fruit explorers. Um, you know, we want to reach out to Spanish speakers in Mexico. It'd be great to have Mexican growers. 
Um, it would, you know, our roots are from Can Canadians, you know, and it would be great to, to return back to having a strong membership in Canada. There's so many people doing amazing things in Canada. And uh, there was somebody that posted recently that, um, uh, that uh, we lost, uh, we, we've lost a lot of the tropical fruit growers. And I, I think it's, it would be good to have uh, more tropical fruit growers. So anyway, that's what I wanted to say. Thanks for listening. Great, thank you. So if there are any other questions, um, you got, I should have uh, put up a screenshot of our email address, but um, we, you can reach out to us at any time. Um, you can reach out through the website or by emailing us. Um, at this point, I'm gonna ask, um, because I'm in a teaching facility and we have another group coming in here. Um, I'm gonna ask one of our board members to um, make a motion to close the meeting. I'll move as Leslie. We have a, does someone second it please? I'll second, second. it. All right, so I got two seconds. <laughs> <laughs> we'll take Larry, I think he got there first. <laughs> all right, so all those in favor of uh, closing the meeting, please use the poll, the vote function that, we, that popped up on your screen. Yes, no, I can't imagine anyone wants to extend it. <laughs> but, <laughs> <laughs> but please, um, as you're doing that, a reminder. So tonight we have the agroforestry conference session, which is going to be phenomenal. Um, tomorrow on our agenda is um, the Plum Detective, which um, is going to be very cool with Rachel um, Spieth from uh, Luther Burbank Home and Gardens. And then tomorrow night is happy hour. So bring your favorite beverage and um, we're gonna give people the floor five to 10 minutes to talk about what they're doing, any cool tricks or things like that. I've got a couple, couple people already lined up um, and I do wanna spend you know, five or 10 minutes either with Eric or you know, one of us, Eric doesn't know this yet, but maybe we can recruit him as a, as a member to get online and show us the regional help. If not, I can do it. Um, but uh, show it, show some of the tools that are available and kind of dig into the website so you guys can see what's available to you there. And that's going to keep expanding. All the all the stuff that we have acquired through this conference, all of our speakers are, are really um, pitching in and sending a lot of good information. That's all going to be made available to you. So with that, um, hopefully we have enough votes to close the meeting. And I want to thank all of you for coming. And I hope to see many of you tomorrow at either the afternoon and or evening session. So thank you guys. Have a fabulous day and join us tonight for the Agroforestry Conference. Great job. Thanks. You're Thanks, welcome. Everybody. Bye. Line and wave if you want. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Thanks everyone.